Okay, so today is March 11th, 2022. We are at the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center in the uh, theater space on the second floor on, at 922 San Pedro. And I am with, uh, go ahead and state your name, sir. It's uh, Richard Herrera. Thank you. And um, what is your what what is your title or your or your um, the the you know the the DJ the DJ business I've been in the DJ business for over thirty seven years. I call myself the uh, his, uh, Chicano Dick Clark, and it's, I'm seventy one years old and I'm still I'm still booked to the end of the year. And I and fortunately because I play my my age group I stay away from quinceañeras and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I play play my age group by my I don't have a. Uh, a certain genre that I play, I play everything. And if I have to play for youngsters, I, I got their dual lipas, the weekends, I got uh, just about everything I need because I asked for a playlist before I get started. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, it's, a, it's been a, a love of mine since I was a child. And I learned a lot of my, my lines from listening to KONO, KTSA, those DJs, and I was picking up off their lines so that I could, when I presented myself as a disc jockey, because I do not shut up, and I will tell you a few jokes, and I'll, I'll explain the song, and uh, I'll do things like, uh, I'll explain to the crowd, I say, you know, our, our age group, going back to our age group, and uh, I, you know, I'll explain the song, I said, you remember back in the day when we used to go to the dances and stuff like that, and you had a little surprise for your girlfriend, and uh, you would explain to her how much you loved her and the whole thing, and could you please have this, and it was either a chain with a heart, maybe a promise ring, a sweetheart ring, and this song was playing at the time. This token of love by Sonny. You know, and it, it just, and I'll do that at a live show and people just go like, what? And that's what I do. I interact with the, with the, with the I'm not afraid to get a, a, a wireless mic and go into the, the crowd and interview people, ask them where they come from, say, what school did you go to, Breckenridge? You know, you went to South Sand, Harlandale, Edgewood, Kennedy. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, where, where are you from? I'm from San Antonio, Texas, born in, uh, in 1951, January 20, 1951. I was born in La Calle Veracruz, in Frio, in the uh, Mero Barrio. In the west side. And I had a, uh, a midwife bring me into this world. And I think my dad said he paid like 20 bucks for that service back in 51. And uh, because I was a boy, my dad wanted a case of beer. Because a friend said, it's going to be a girl, I'll bet you, I can't bet you a case of beer. So my dad wanted a case of beer as I entered this world. Do you have uh, siblings? I have uh, three other brothers. My dad was married previously. So I have a stepsister and a stepbrother. And I love them to death. They're older than me, but we never had sisters. There were four boys growing up. And uh, the, the, we never had females in the house except mom. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, when I got to meet her when she was in her 20s and so was I, oh, I fell in love with her, man. And I just talked to her just this morning. So, yeah, we, we, we were very close. And, and um, like I said, we went to the local schools here in the, in the, on the west side. Even though for a period of time we were in Los Angeles. But we were in L.A. when uh, the music died that night that uh, Buddy Holly and the big, you know, big Bopper and, and Richie Valens died. Oh, wow. And I remember the newspaper. Front page was his uh, Richie's mom with it holding up the guitar. So that, and then like I said, made it to the West Side. Ended up at uh, Edgewood Elementary in the fifth grade, and from there we ended up becoming actual Chicanos because we were pochos over there. Yeah. And here we're Chicanos, and I had to learn Spanish. I didn't know it. I was, I was you know predominantly English speaking because of Los Angeles. My parents spoke Spanish. We understood it. We couldn't speak it because it came out funny. Mm -hmm. So you're you're born and raised on the west side. What what did that what influence did that have on your life? You know what 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 my influence was the uh, the culture. What it gave me was how to respect, how to be honest. Because grandma te traba la oreja, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And we always had discipline wherever we went. Tia Emma, tia, but you know, Lily, and they, they they would jump you real quick. They'll correct you right then and there. And we did, you know this is so strange. We never, growing up, we never cussed around our teachers. We respected them. Mm -hmm. You know, we never did that. Like, hey, we wouldn't dare talk back to our parents nor anything of anybody of authority. We, mm -hmm. we, we learned that. So, uh, and, and then and I learned the music because our parents, wherever they went, would it, would it be a nice house? If it was a nice house, a beer joint, 
We'd go to a lounge and we were four brothers. We'd fall asleep underneath the pool table because we were sleeping as late. Yeah. And these people, are men are playing pool and we're under the table and you can hear the music blaring. So we grew up around music. My parents had house parties on the weekends, invite all the Tejano friends. And they would dance, you know, and I would see them dance, polkas, cumbias. And when the cha-cha-cha hit at one point, my parents learned it and were teaching their friends in the living room. Mm -hmm. They would send me to us. We all slept in one bedroom. Remember, it was small houses. And go to bed, plans in a dormir. And sure enough, yeah, we'd go to the room. But I would be watching because I had a direct shot to the living room. Open the door. And I'm checking them out. And I'm watching them dance. And I'm listening to the music. So instead, I, that's, I grew up with music around me at, at all times. And uh, a lot of my friends growing up were musicians. And I always got invited to their jam sessions or their practices at the garage and that mm -hmm. type of stuff. So I grew up around music. And the reason I became a DJ is because I never learned how to be or become a musician. Because first of all, we couldn't afford it. And people say, what do you mean you can afford it? Well, you know, I don't know you're looking at it. I was in high school in 64. Mm -hmm. where, where were you there in high school? I was at oh, Edgewood High School. Edgewood. I was at... Uh, Roosevelt Elementary when we moved to the west side. Ever mm -hmm. since Roosevelt on the west side, La Calle Fortuna and San Joaquin, there's oh, a Roosevelt okay. in the Edgewood District. Uh -huh. Franklin Roosevelt. From there we went out to Escobar uh, Junior High at the time. No such thing as middle school. And we would go to the, the, the dances there at, uh, at Escobar. Mm -hmm. And uh, they charge a quarter to get in. And, we, and we, we, what we saw there and witnessed was our local friends actually had combos at the time. Mm -hmm. It was a little four-piece combo, and that's what I, it's a combo, you know. So uh, we learned, I, mean, I got picked up on that music, and then as we were growing into, as far as the neighborhood, once we got to, like, es Escobar was a junior high, and we get to Edgewood, you know, all of a sudden we started listening to the Rudy T's and Sonny and the Sunliners and the Jesters, and all those guys were just coming up. I mean, they were young, even though we were younger, mm -hmm. but that was the music we were listening to because even KONO, KTC was playing that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you just mentioned some of those uh, some of those artists that we hear people refer to as West Side Sound artists. What is what is West Side Sound? Well, I'm gonna tell you, West Side Sound is something that developed, and I got a little something, a little presentation I want to make that developed uh, also by because of the radio records, and uh, I, I I made a CD here. The only research I've ever done is on this CD, and I call it Let's Compare because uh, Sunny put out a song called Out of Sight, Out of Mind. Out of Sight, Out of Mind. Well, he, we're thinking as kids, it's the original. Mm -hmm. That's Sonny, oh my God, this, you know, he's a genius. Well, actually, the, the guys who put out that song were the five keys. You know, and then there's another song, like the Let There Be You uh, by the Royal Jesters. That is also the five keys. And we're thinking that, you know, these guys are just, oh my God, because that's what we were used to. We were, since we were, we weren't traveling anywhere mm -hmm. beyond Bear County. Mm -hmm. This is what we got used to. That's what we learned. And uh, like uh, we go together, it's done by the Moon Glows. And the Royal Jesters redid it mm -hmm. their way, made it their own. And we were convinced this is it. But And the reason they, they ended up learning this stuff is because mm -hmm. we got to remember they were older than us. Mm -hmm. And they were listening to the radio plus. And since they were doing little gigs out of town, small stuff, they would pick up from the other musicians what was happening mm -hmm. and bring it back to the barrio, learn the songs, and, and then present it to us. Mm -hmm. But and, and the West Side Sound is, is my, what I, my definition is, they were learning black music and they would put their own music to it, almost similar to the, the original, mm -hmm. but with the black, they were trying to sing black, but since we're Chicanos, we got a little twang in, in, our, in, our, in, in, in our voices. So with that, I, I'm saying that combination of the, the Hispanic sound, as the, verbiage or you know the way we would present it and the combination of the black music and us trying to imitate the blacks that's your west side song mm -hmm. so you see a lot of uh, you hear a lot of black influence in west side sound music uh, what do you um can you give us some examples of that of uh the, the, i just gave you some oh some of these keys and, and yeah i got more here i got uh let's see we got uh let's see Rogers a little talk to me biggest hit the sunny it took it took him to american bandstand he didn't write it Little Willie John put that song, it's the original. Uh -huh. So, but we didn't know. And, and if you go through the, through the history, you find out that, that because Sonny got 
uh, did this and recorded the song, he got sued for it. Oh, wow. Yeah, he got sued for it. And that, his fine was, at that time, was a lot of money. But if you think about it now, it really wasn't a big fine. Yeah. Because somebody yeah. owned the rights to little, the, little uh, Willie Johnson's discography. Oh, okay. So you that, think the what, so you think the instruments also were influenced by, by other genres of music? No, we stuck, they, they stuck basics. You know, it's a bass guitar, lead guitar, drums, you know, horns, mm -hmm. uh, keyboards. You know, keyboards came in later. And the reason the keyboards came in, as you're, because we had orchestras when we were children. I mean, mm -hmm. the band Monsanto, Sonny had a huge orchestra. Mm -hmm. You know, you get, you get together with the Latin breed, they had 10 members. Mm -hmm. You know, the Royal Jesters had 10 members. And over the years, because of economics, the keyboard came in, and it had a lot of features that like you could play horns, you could do a, a you know, you could, uh, make an auto so sound of a, of an engine of a car, uh, using all this stuff. So what happened? The keyboard took over the brass section, mm -hmm. and that cut those guys out, put them out of a job. So, uh, like I said, it's uh, it, the, the evolution of our, of our sound, and it's coming back now. People are coming back with, with more, more horns and stuff, and uh, thank God for that. But uh, that's how it worked back in those, in those days, and that full orchestration, mm -hmm. you know, as far as that's concerned. I had a big orchestra. When I got married, I had Rocco Villarreal play for my wedding. He was oh, the hottest okay. thing going. I got married in 74 mm -hmm. and had our wedding at the convention center. <laughs> at the Henry B. Gonzalez? <laughs> and we were there at the mission room. Wow, yes. wow. Yeah, we had a, we had a uh, 500 seat venue, and that room, at that time, cost us $125 to rent. I have the receipt to prove it. <laughs> I'm serious. And we had a great time, fantastic time. Definitely. Well, um, you know, we're, we're talking about West Side Sound, some of the instruments, the songs. Um, you know, you talked about this was music that you heard growing up. Um, is that something that, you, that your siblings share with you? They also listen to oh, that music? My kids, whatever we know, whatever, I taught them everything. Mm -hmm. They know everything about, you know, Little Willie John, they know everything about mm -hmm. Fats Domino, Little Richard. Uh, the Temptations, Marvin Gaye, mm -hmm. Henry James, they know, they know all that stuff. So it, it's traveled those generations? It's traveled because we made it, we made it so. Because there's a lot of people today uh, that don't even know, that are my age or even younger, and they, their kids don't know nothing but what's the top 40 right mm -hmm. now, what's, what's happening, yep. pop-wise and rap-wise. So, You personally, what are some of your favorite bands or songs? Oh my from God. West Side, from West Side Sound. West Side Sound? Uh, Sonny's Runaway. That is, I, I love that song, Runaway. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as other, let's see, we, I, I love Dimas Garza. Dimas Garza. Uh, he's got some, some really, really, really hot numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, since he was in love with his wife, because I, I, I knew Dimas personally, and, uh, and I want to make a correction on Dimas because I heard a podcast the other day said he was a carpenter. He was never a carpenter. He was a carpet layer. Let's get that straight. Por favor. So as to uh, all those, all those, the, I, you know, like I said, I don't have notes with me or nothing, and and a lot of times I can't get things off the top of my head because mm -hmm. I don't have notes. <laughs> but as I look around, <laughs> I, we have, uh, like I said, that was a uh, what some of the the, the, the most the precious songs, and uh, as far as being, uh, I'm concerned, when I started dating my wife mm -hmm. in 1967, there was a song called uh, "Teenage Promise." It says, to, it says, to you, to you, I will be true. You know, this teenage promise, dear, I will make without fear. And my God, that was, that was summer, and that was the song, yeah. man. Especially for young kids that were in love. Yep. So, it, it, so there's so many out there, it, it's, it's hard to... To even put my finger on them because you didn't give me enough time to, to, to study. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> well, you you mentioned you've got some stuff around you. Is there something you want to show us oh, particularly? I got this. This is this little guy right here. That's Sonny, the Sunliners, uh -huh. with his band. And his nickname as a child or this young man, his name, they call him Bunny. I don't know if you heard that already. I have not. They call him Bunny. And according to the folklore, come on, tell you, what I'm telling you is what they told me. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, you would know where to find it to make it to verify it unless you talk to Sonny. Suppose they were going to a gig and they needed to change their names and uh, they stopped in front of a sunglow to gas up or whatever. Uh -huh. And they liked the name Sunglow 
and they sat there during that period of time, by the time they got from that point to point A to point B, they came up with, hey, let's call this the sun glows. But we got Bunny, the front man, let's change his name to Sonny. <laughs> so it became Sonny and the sun glows after that. So Sonny's not his actual name? No, his name is uh, Ida Alfonso. Oh, okay. So I would change my name to Sonny too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's his name, Ida Alfonso, and I blame that on the Mexican calendar because back in the day when you were born, the calendars had the, the names of saints mm -hmm. right below it. And if you were born on San Felipe, your name was going to be Felipe. You know what I mean? And oh, that's okay. A, that's I didn't know that. Yes. You check a Mexican calendar out, they have a saint, the saints' names. They got a whole bunch of them. Uh -huh. And uh, if you were uh, Epi uh, Epifanio, and landed on Epifania Day, that was your name for the day. Thank God my parents didn't have a calendar yeah. to name me Richard. <laughs> and, no, uh, definitely. Yeah, it's, uh, and I got, I have like here, we got the almost, uh, oh, this, this is the Latin legends that Roger Velasquez put together, and he put together, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, he's got uh, Richard Solis, one of the main, baddest drummers in, the, in, the, in Texas, Gilbert Velasquez, Frank Perez, and uh, get Pete Garza, one of the, the best bass players supposedly in the history, and that's because they told me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I used to, you know, check out their dances, yeah. and they were really monster. The Latin breed was, they were really, really, they, they put a real big dent mm -hmm. into uh, the Tejano folklore and, and, and our, our existence right here. Mm -hmm. So and, you've uh, got, you've got, you're showing me pictures and autographs um, that kind of remind me of what I see when I walk into a Janie's record shop or into, you know, Gilbert's Mexican restaurant. Yes. Do you consider them and yourself people that preserve that music? Yes, because, I, like I said, it's really funny that we, at that the Janie's and her family, Gilbert, myself, and uh, Jesse, Jesse Garcia, mm -hmm. that stuff, it, you know, as, as we grew up, we soaked it in, but we never let it go. Mm -hmm. I was never influenced by the white influence as far as that's concerned. A lot of our young kids today, oh my God, they, all they listen to is country. And I'm going like, what? You know, <laughs> and, uh, and we preserved it and it affected us because every song will take me back to a place uh, in time, either uh, my wife, a dance, mm -hmm. uh, an incident, a tragedy, that, that, that song will take you right back. But that was our music, Del Barrio, Mm -hmm. And that stayed with me. And the thing is that I want to preserve it. See, all this stuff, I'm going to pass it on to, to the University of Texas. They want this stuff, and I'm going to give it to them. They already asked for it. I'm not giving it up until I die. And I have some other things that I, I need, they asked me for, but that's another subject. And uh, I got, uh, I got this, is, uh, this is Rocky Hernandez. He's out of Edgewood. And like mm -hmm. I said, a lot of these guys are Edgewood cats. And this is a this is not a monster musician, mm -hmm. this is, and they're all children. So, the so you're you know you keep mentioning these these people who are either from Edgewood, they're the the San Antonio. Yeah. Um, do you think that this this genre lived on because of the pride that that comes from from San Antonio, from the West Side? Um, what do you what do you think about that? Why is this music continuing to live on? Well, for us as as children, remember we had no transportation. So mm -hmm. once you go, you got to the record store and this was on the radio, you go, you bought that, you lived with it. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it, a lot of people kept their music. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of my records that originally that I bought in the 60s wow. and the 70s and the 80s. And then being a disc jockey, I continued growing and, uh, and adding to my collection. And what happens is the music fades away, you put it away. Mm -hmm. And you got it in your collection, and it becomes dust collectors. My wife wants me to throw all that stuff away. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to do it. But I got posters, and the thing about it, that these are personal friends. They would invite me to to jam sessions uh, or uh, recording studios. Rich, we got so-and-so planned. Come on down. Mm -hmm. You know, I've sat in with Jay Perez, uh, Joe Lopez and Maz, La Sombra. Mm -hmm. I've sat in a lot of those sessions. I got invited to them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a matter of... You know, I just showed up as a, as a groupie. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the fabric of the music because back in the day when I started with the DJ business, musicians hated us. And not as much as at the beginning, as it's closer to the maybe in my 10th or 11th, 12th year in the business, that they, re, they realized, and I realized that we were taking their gigs. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is that I tell people, when you hire me, everybody shows up. 
They say, what do you mean? Ruben Ramos, Roberto Pulido, Anthony Jackson, five. You know, I can add, I, I got everything mm -hmm. there. So mm -hmm. uh, when you um you know you said you get these gigs, you were getting these gigs. Mm -hmm. Um, where where were people when you were getting these gigs? Where were people listening to West Side Sound? When would they come up to you and say, "I want to hear Sunny"? Was it everywhere in San Antonio? Was it? it, it uh, well, we know it, predominantly south, south and west, west side, mm -hmm. south side. Mm -hmm. It was it was you know it was a word stuck in a, in, a, in a in a corral per se mm -hmm. because you, uh, all the dances were at St. Francis, Blessed Sacrament, Edgewood, Brackenridge, Lanier, mm -hmm. and that's all within the that 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 area of south and west side. So, like I said, we were being forced, not really realizing it, but we were being force fed, mm -hmm. and we were liking it, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's how that, that that group got you know got into our blood, mm -hmm. and made a lot of people collectors, and there's the little tokens things that you don't want to you don't want to give up, you mm -hmm. know, it's it's mine, and I have a room that's my. It's like I got everything up there, posters. I got Selena. I got everybody up there. Signatures. I got an autograph book. This is an autograph book. I brought it here on this side. I got pictures with all. I got Laura Canales, Ruben Ramos. I got mm -hmm. them all. I got pictures because I used to work or volunteer for Texas Talent uh, TTMA mm -hmm. back in the day since they started, and I got to to volunteer for them and, and work backstage. And I got pictures with uh, you know Teach Marine. Uh, the lady from uh, West Side Story, mm -hmm. Rita Moreno. Oh, okay. I have, I have autograph. I have all that stuff. I'm an autograph collector. Definitely. Also. Um, you know, you talk about about hearing music when you were a kid, and then also, you know, the music that reminds you of different different instances in your life. Was there a certain time in your life where you felt like, man, music's my thing? Or were you always a DJ? Did you have, you know, an oh, other, well, other career? Let me tell you, when we were kids. I'm, uh, we, we were living uh, on the west side, of the, in front of the gym, the Edgewood gym on Eldridge Street, 35th. My parents would come home on a Friday night after working a hard week, you know, and my dad was a, a meat cutter. He worked very hard. My mom worked uh, at a, a, a shoot a hat factory. They get home and they go, they get home after work and they go grocery shopping, Centeno, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. On Commerce Street, mm -hmm. buy all their groceries. Mom would come home, put everything away, make a big dinner. They, they would buy these quartz, they called jumbos back in the day, mm -hmm. Jack's beer. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what we would do, we were four brothers, since the Temps and the Tops and James Brown, and we do Roy Orbison, we did, we would do costume changes with our uncle and my dad's coats and stuff like that. And while my parents were, were drinking their beer, and we would put on records and we were doing choreography. Yeah. And, and we would dance for them and we did that. So what's so strange about that is that and I've been, I've been 12 years old at that point, 12, 13. So I was junior high. No, not 11, 12. And uh, that the, the, the ironic thing is that once I started my DJ business, by chance, and that's another story also, that my DJ business I started because uh, I was playing for a teacher group. I was a, a, a teacher that also taught in Edgewood, mm -hmm. retired from Edgewood. I would do the teacher union parties at Rodriguez Park, Highway 90. And uh, they, a teacher came up to me and said, Rich, can you, would you do my Christmas party for me for a particular elementary? I said, sure, no problem. What would you charge me? I said, ah, I gave you 50 bucks. 50 bucks, yeah, you know, I had the first pay gig. Well, what happened, he sends me the tickets to the event, which was three months away, and it's gonna be at the Kelly Officers Club. I got a little Panasonic record player that, with a flip top, and a cassette player. I'm, I'm flip flopping cassette and two little speakers this big. I'm doing that at the park. I can't take that equipment to to the officer's club. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so I, me being a perfectionist, trying to be trying to be a perfectionist, I got to the newspaper and just to make a long story short, I went to San Marcos, different places, and I put together a DJ system that cost me a thousand dollars to get paid fifty. Yeah, <laughs> and that's how I got started. Yeah, because that money came out of my our our budget. My wife and I we were married. What was your job before that? What were you? What was uh, your trade, or what were you working no, I, in? I, I retired from the telephone company. Oh, from which which one? Southwestern Bell. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, mean, I did a career with Southwestern Bell. I did right when me and my wife got married. I was a truck driver, delivering, doing deliveries. I told her, look, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do as many gigs as I can to replace the thousand mm dollars. -hmm. And after that. As I DJ got further and further along down the road, 
I develop a um, a dance, a, 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 what, a song and dance group. Mm -hmm. We were doing karaoke before karaoke was ever even invented. Mm -hmm. And I was getting my soundtracks from uh, Southern Music on Broadway. And they had a voice tracks, soundtrack in the back, perfect orchestration. So I had nightclub singers that, could, that were older and their wives didn't want them to go to the clubs because they wouldn't make it home until four or five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'm paying top dollar. I'm paying these guys a hundred bucks a night. And, I, and as a DJ, and I still made money. And uh, we, we got into that. So that group lasted for 10 solid years until my guys started getting older and sick and they got, you know, the uh, cancer and uh, all this stuff. So I ended up back to where I started as a single DJ. So mm -hmm. that's what I do today. And I've been doing that. I said, I've been doing that. Uh, the total amount, besides the shows, we played with well, that show. I had to buy a bus, a small school bus. We traveled all of South Texas. We did Laredo. We did Comfort. We did Dallas. All the, the hill country stuff. Mm -hmm. Lakey and Duvalde and all that. We did all those. Things. And we were booked 15 to 30 weeks at a time. And that was a Friday, Saturdays, and sometimes Sundays. Definitely. We, you know, we've talked a lot about, about the music itself. Um, one of the things that, that interests me um, that I think people would like to know is... You know, how would, how would people show up dressed to these types of things? Dressed. Dressed to the T. And that's another thing. In high school, we, we couldn't wear tennis. You wore your floor shines, your Plymouth, your Tama cans, wing tips, or cap toes, dress slacks, tucked in shirt, your hair had to be just right. And that's the way you went to school. Girls, girls in our school could not wear dresses. They had to wear, uh, they couldn't wear pants. They had to wear dresses. Let me reverse that. They couldn't wear pants. They had to wear dresses with a nice little uh, leather, whatever, pad type of uh, shoe, hair done, and the, the skirt right above the knee. You can't go there. I'll say measure them. And, uh, you know, dressed. We were dressed. Uh, what, what bothers me today is, is you go to church. I'm a Catholic. And my people are coming in with shorts and chanclas. What the heck is that? We used to go to church and put on at least a coat and a tie. Mm -hmm. But Even, but specifically to to these these events where they're hearing West Side Sound, what did what did those types of idols look like? What well, the, the high school dances? Uh huh. Dress slacks, your leather shoes, and your three quarter sleeves, tucked in, and everything came from Penners or from Kleins or Joskies, mm -hmm. National Shirt Shop. They those were all the many places shops that we shopped. Yeah, no, no, they, I mean, they, you, your crease had to be perfect, your, your shoes were polished, and your shirt was done just perfect, and you, everybody had a handkerchief to wipe off the sweat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you said uh, Penners, what, what were the other two? Penners, Kleins, and uh, Jaskis, and uh, what else did I tell you? National Shirt Shop. So people not from San Antonio, can you explain what those shops were, what those, what those stores were? They were men's, men's, uh, men's wear, and the thing about it, if I shop Nationals, I was in the group, you know, yeah. it, it was all peer pressure. Yeah. And if you bought uh, pros and pinners, are you kidding me? You must be rich, you know, <laughs> because their their shoe, their their Stacy Adams were selling for thirty two fifty, and I can get a, a, a say a knockoff pair at Tama Cats of uh, wingtips for seven fifty. Mm -hmm. See, so we would buy those, and then Joskis also sold what they call a Plymouth for nineteen nineteen dollars and change. They were just almost just like Penner stuff. Yeah. So we all we all competed, and then the funny thing is, that Nationals would sell say a, uh, say a shirt with a certain print, mm -hmm. and make a, a, a an orange, a yellow, a brown, a blue, and I would buy all four shirts. And every yeah. time I went to school, everybody was wearing the same shirts. But uh, yeah, we were we, we were very conscientious about our dress. Very. Well, I'm gonna take a quick break, real quick, to switch out the the card. So all give right. me just a second. All right, quick little break. Um, I, I meant to ask you in the beginning, just want to make sure. So this is for the UTSA Oral History uh, Project for the West Side Sound. Um, do we have your permission to use your video for this project? Sure, sure. Okay, and the the project will be stored in the UTSA uh, collection, so we'll let you know Super duper. where that goes. Um, so we were talking a little bit about the dress um, that we would see during West, you know, when people were listening to West Side Sound. 
Um, was it mostly Mexicanos or Chicanos that were at these dances or when this when the community was, was together? It was, it was Chicanos and, and uh, Mexican Americans, you know, because the, the, they had us confused totally back in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it was uh, the dress was uh, the, like the Edgewood Canteen dances at my high school every Wednesday for fifty cents. You could see some of the top acts from from San Antonio play there every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. The thing about Edgewood that they allowed the entire city to show up. Mm -hmm. They didn't cut it out to Edward Students Loan, show me an idea, there was no such thing as Brackenridge showed up, Lanier showed up, Tech showed up, La Salle back in those days, they were Catholic school. I went to Tech. There you go, <laughs> Tech. And we were always friends with Tech, red and white. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, no, that, that was the most fantastic. People met girls, girls met guys, that they would have never come across had they not attended the canteen. And there were Edgewood canteens, not teen canteen. Mm -hmm. Teen canteen somewhere else, but not, it's Edgewood canteen. For 50 cents, and that went on for years. Yeah. Sonny showed up there. We had the commands show up to the Edgewood canteen and, and perform for 50 cents. So when they were performing, when you were playing music, you know, every time this music was coming up, are, were there special like dances or things that that people did? Like the, you know, people have talked to me about the stroll or you know what 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 type of dancing did you see? A lot of it, well, no, well, a lot of it was the stroll, but there were always also dances, you know, like the jerk. You know what I mean? The jerk. You did the twist, mm -hmm. and they did the hitchhike with with uh, Rudy T's hitchhike, hitchhike baby, and be, there was a dance for all that. Now there was also walking the dog. When I was a kid, I went to my my cousin's dances up there, right in the middle of town, or right before you cross the bridge. They did uh, uh, the what was it? They were doing the walking the dog, and they had a dance to it, and they did almost like a a stroll dance, but it was a little faster. Mm -hmm. And you do the same thing: go to the end of the line and come back down mm -hmm. to walking the dog. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of dances. Uh, because we, we learned about from, from American Bandstand, you know, the, the Frug and the Watusi and, you know, uh, the mashed potato, all that stuff was happening back then. You had, there was more dances to dance to, so if you got on a dance floor, depending on what you could do, that's what you did. Mm -hmm. If you want to dance a jerk, you dance a jerk, you do the twist and uh, the Watusi or whatever, you know, you're doing the monkey, the mashed potato. Jump back, check, see you later, alligator. And they had the alligator, that, that, that particular dance. So, yeah, they uh, there were there were dances at the time that were in existence, and people to this day still dance that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. if you do especially a, a throwback dance, yeah. something like that. Yeah, you mentioned the twist. My, my grandpa said he was the king of the twist uh, at a dance that he went to. And Chucky Checker, as far as the twist is concerned, you go back and check also, and then you uh, cross-check. In 1960, I think the twist came out in 1960, hit number one. The following year, in 1961, it hit number one again. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, and dancing has changed a lot since then. As far as dancing is concerned? Uh-huh. In San Antonio, it is very surprising to me. Yes, dancing has changed completely. But right now, we're stuck in a line dance pattern. Mm-hmm. Because I do that, I, I do all the dances that you know, different age categories. Mm -hmm. I had a viejita the other day at a quince. I did a 16th, and I said, I don't do the quince, I did. I did a 16th birthday party in, in, uh, in Los Elotes. And a lady comes up to me and says, Mijo, do you have the wobble? <laughs> and I said, Yes, ma'am. And I looked at her, This lady is not going to dance well. I put the wobble on, she was the first one on the dance yeah. floor. So it affects grandmas, and since it's such a rep repetitive dance, you know, like uh, the, the uh, oh, what do you call that? Oh my God, I, I, I lose my train of thought. You get the wobble, the cuba shuffle, the electric slide, and the, uh, that boot scoot and boogie. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves us. That. That's, that's, we're stuck in that, as far as dancing is concerned. Yeah. The rest are porcas, cumbia, salsa, merengue. Uh, but there's actually, when it comes to top 40, not really much dancing yeah. out there that you can, you can yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I, that I found interesting is a lot of people who were military. Were, were you military by chance? I was, uh, yeah, I was in the Army. Army oh, Army okay. Yes, some, uh, you know, a lot of people told me that, that some of this music that came from West Side Sound, um, you know, there's there's stories of uh, Little Joe sending records to veterans or, you know, some of the some of the artists, um, you know, doing special shows and stuff for, for veterans, people people who had went off to war and things right. like that. Um, do you have any stories about that or have you heard anything about that? 
about music going. To, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't. If you recall, you weren't probably not born yet, but anyway, but there was a, a little apparatus, a little record player that was about this big, uh -huh. and it opened up. It would remove the top. It was a little turntable, battery operated, or uh -huh. you could plug it in. Uh -huh. It would play an album which would stick beyond the the, the little apparatus, or you could do the 45s. Mm -hmm. They went overseas like crazy, man. Mm -hmm. Guys took their collections and they would play, you know, drink beer, do whatever they do, and listen to the music. Like the, the, the Chicano music, West Side Sound was overseas, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and. You think it was only people from San Antonio, from Texas, or were there people oh, all over California, picking that up? Yeah. Califas had their own style of uh, music, but uh, it, uh, a lot of it came from, from San Antonio in that direction. It would go in that direction because, you know, migrant workers and stuff like that, mm -hmm. they would take the, they'd go to California and, and, and pick the fields of the, whatever they had to do with it, take their, their culture with them and their music, mm -hmm. and it, it transcended. All look at South, uh, South uh, California, Puros Tejanos, because mm -hmm. when we were in, 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 in Los Angeles a short time, bit of time when I was in the 50s, it was, man, Tejanos everywhere, mm -hmm. and they, they ended up coming with Tejano stations. Well, things since then has changed, since the, the demographics has flip-flopped, and mm -hmm. uh, Mexico jumped into California, and now it's all... Banda and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had primos and they call me rich. Send me some stuff. No, I'm dying out here, man. Yeah. <laughs> and I and I ship out CDs. I make them personalized. What do you need? I need this. And I'll, and I'll send them to them. I do that to everybody. And I get all this stuff that I got. I give it away. You need this picture? I'll, I got duplicates. I'll give you whatever you need. I don't I don't sell a thing. I don't sell nothing. I want. I need to push it forward because once I'm gone, who's going to push it? I, I, I sell this product as far as, you know, uh, the idea. And look, let me show you this, and let me show you that. And, mm -hmm. and, and I got a little, a little set. It's called West Side Oldies. This uh -huh. is, these are the originals, one through 10. These sold throughout all, a lot of the West Side record stores, uh -huh. a lot of the, uh, the flea markets uh, throughout. And these are all bootleg. Mm -hmm. And it's got to like 25 songs a piece. Of almost just about every band that existed in, in San Antonio. There's a whole bunch of titles in here with names, including Henry Pena, you know, and uh, like uh, Gilbert, and the, Gilbert uh, Cravos and the Mystics was an Edgewood group, and I got a picture of them somewhere around here. And uh, they, uh, they, uh, they were they were influences in, in the environment for us. And it just, uh, like I said, I go back here, and somebody says, Rich, you got this, uh, this particular song? I'll find it here. I'll download it, put it on a disc, and I'll send it to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You think you think this music's going to going to outlive us? You think it will continue to be for a period of time? No, 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 no. I, I'm telling people. I told because Jesus Garcia is a big collector. Get rid of your music now that there's some interest. Because in ten years, nobody's gonna give a damn. I'm telling you, nobody's gonna care. Now, who's Sunny? Who's the jesters? Mm -hmm. All that stuff's gonna go by the wayside, like everything else does. Mm -hmm. You know, it comes, it grows, it goes away. So you don't think it's kind of like you know the old boleros and rancheras that that stick around? That and... will that will live on with our elders, and if they teach their kids that, uh, as far as bolero and rancheras, the, and this is another funny thing. I did that 16th birthday party there in Los Elotes. The lady gave me the girl that gave me a, a top 25. Do a lipa a weekend. I need this. I need that. I had it, and the first thing they asked for, sir, do you have a chata? Yes. <laughs> so I played my chata, Prince Royce, and all that stuff. And then I do three or four of those numbers, and I'm gonna throw out something that she had asked me for. And a little girl runs up to me, chiquita, thirteen. Sir, do you have rancheras? <laughs> and we started doing rancheras. It was the easiest sixteenth birthday I've ever done. I was. Sweating bullets, hoping the guy they accept me because of my age. And all I just, you know, I put on a tuxedo, do my, color my hair, color my mustache. Hey, from a distance, nobody knows I'm 71. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's that's why I asked that about do you think this music will, will last on? Because nowadays it feels like to me that I see that that younger people are saying, you know what, maybe I do want to know a little more about my culture. Maybe I do want to hear some 
some mariachi. Maybe I want to look at the folklorico dancers. Um, now it's becoming popular, right? To, it's, to it's feel that coming culture. Back. It's, it's coming back. And you know why? Because the music of today is, it has no message for nobody. There is no message. It's like that teenage promise. God, no, that was a going steady song. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, Janie used to tell me all the time from Janie's record shop, mm -hmm. Las canciones eran de amor o de desamor yeah. o de, you know, they had, they had, la they musica had a, es vida, she would say. They had a message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, music is life and without music there is no life, mm -hmm. you know. But I agree with Janie. I bought a lot of my stuff from her. I bought videos from her. I, in fact, I took a picture with her almost weeks before she passed. So I, if you see that black and white photo of her, that's, you know, from when she passed. I took that photo took that a photo? few years ago. Uh huh. Um, and that's when I, you know, and, and that's why I, you know, this project is special to me because, you know, it was people like Janie and, and Robert and Becky and, you know, the family there that got me interested so much more in, in expanding what I was listening to in music. Um, but, you know, that kind of brings me to a topic that, that Rambo recently brought up and he said, you know, um, our gente sometimes are the ones that can't afford to buy this music. And so there's other cultures that are taking it and, and buying it. You, have you seen that? Do you see that at all? Well, you know, uh, everything we've ever done, and it's really funny because we swap out Musical Mexico. I'm going to talk back to the 60s. Mm -hmm. 60s, Mexico and Texas were equal. Mm -hmm. Our music was almost identical. Mm -hmm. It's when it changed to banda and this other stuff, then it just, now we're totally apart. Mm -hmm. But back then, you know, you had Lorenzo Monteclaro and you had Gerardo Reyes, all these Mexican artists, but they were singing. They were in our jukeboxes in our in, in our in our in our bars, and our music was in their their jukeboxes in in, in Laredo. We'd go to Laredo and they, man, they got uh, you know uh, Rene Rene playing. You know, the mucho que te quiero on the, on, the, on their on their side. Now that doesn't exist on, over there in Mexico at all. At all. Mm -hmm. That's become extinct and. And if you put something on them and make us right, <laughs> they'll, they'll let you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. you know, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, our music, uh, the, the Sundays and stuff like that, people may want to say it, it's going to last, but I'm a, real, a realist. It's, we're like dinosaurs. It's just going to fade away. And it only exists in documentaries. Thank you guys for doing this. And, uh, and uh, folklore and our memories. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's uh, you got to remember we borrowed our music from the from the black community, the guys from up north and you know West Coast and stuff, and we kind of duplicated their stuff. So we need to put out stuff that the other people are going to come and say duplicate from us, mm -hmm. and we don't have that base. We, we we duplicated a lot of stuff in Louisiana, Louisiana from Fats Domino and everybody else that from Louisiana. They put out a lot of stuff mm -hmm. that influenced that were being played by. Uh, local combos and bands and stuff, mm -hmm. orchestras in, in, in San Antonio. Did you hear them at the, at the dances? You would hear it. A lot of, a big influence, you know, of, of Louisiana affected us. As we, mm -hmm. And we affected them. You know, Freddie Fender started, his music started popping up over there, on Louisiana side. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, Doug Sam, a lot of Louisiana music. Mm -hmm. He did a lot. But... Uh, I've uh, heard his name come up a lot. Uh, Doug Sam is... Doug Sam... He grew up on the east side, and uh, there was a club, really, really popular club, and I'm going to forget the darn name of the place, even though it's mentioned so many times, that as a kid, 12 years old, he would go and sit at the back door and listen to the music. This isn't the Patio... No, Patio Andalus is downtown. Okay. No, no, no. This is a, a, a Eastwood Country Club. Okay. Eastwood Country Club. Everybody went through there. Edda James, Fats Domino, uh, Chuck Berry, as I mentioned earlier. All the major acts uh, uh, would go through there, mm -hmm. and they were part of what they, what they call the Chitlin Circuit. Mm -hmm. They go through Eastwood Country Club, and I've, I've heard of uh, a lot of my musician friends that were 14 years old allowed to go into the East Side, mm -hmm. the, the club, and sit there and drink a beer or buy a beer. Whatever. If they had money, they'd sell it to you. It was almost out of the city limits per se, I guess. Mm -hmm. But very, very popular place. But everybody came through there. Sam Cook. You know, all those 50s greats. Here in San Antonio. It came through that club in wow. San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Did you go to any of those? I was too darn young, man. Yeah. I didn't even have a car. I got my driver's license at the age of 20. <laughs> so, 
Because I, I didn't need transportation at that point, and I got it because I got stuff. I got a ticket. It says, "Say you better get a driver's license." Take it to the to the judge, and we'll remove the, the ticket. Yeah. That's how I ended up with the driver's license. Yeah. Um, you've got you know you've got a lot more stuff, and I I don't know if we have time to go through everything. But is oh. there are there other things you want to show us, or, or you want to share? This because this is the one, be very ingenious. This is the original Talk to Me album. Oh, what's that? Hold on. I picked up. I'm gonna take it up. I'm gonna mess you up here. There you go. <laughs> You can, you can edit, right? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Talk to me. Came out in the sixties. Biggest album, that man. We bought this album like it's going out of style. And I want to tell you something about Sonny and the Sunliner. Sonny Ozuna was one of uh, I said Tejano artists in San Antonio that could sell an all English album. Everybody else would do a couple of English in, the, in, the, in, the, in their mix, and the rest was podcast of cumbia. And cumbia wasn't really that much that popular back in those days. They put out Talk To Me, and it has two Spanish songs in it. It's got two Spanish songs, and it's uh, Sufriendo y Penando, and the other one is Cariño Nuevo. Okay? They come up with Rags to Riches. The song hits, it's a smash, but no album to put it on. So what do they do? They remove one of the Spanish tunes, and they add Rags to Riches, and they resold Talk To Me, and sold the heck out of it because of the song. Wow. And, wow. and, and that's the, the, you know, the genius of where we put the stuff together. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think one of those is, is worth, an original like that? Oh, it would have to be mint. You know, the, these are used. I can, I can sell this for 10 bucks. Yeah. You know, you got to remember, I, I paid a dollar ninety nine for it at yeah. the time. <laughs> yeah. So $10 is a pretty good, you know, yeah. payback. And you showed me something earlier in Vegas. What, you wanna, can you tell me a little bit about that oh, one? Show this, us that one. This is, I don't want to get in trouble with this one, but anyway. <laughs> Las Vegas, Sonny, live in Las Vegas. Well, he did, was never there. This was done in the studio. And they got the soundtrack, they got the voices, and the whole thing, and the coffee, <laughs> in the audience. But it's, they, he never made Vegas. And they told me that themselves. You know what I mean? It's not something I made up. Yeah. And, uh, and they also, the, the Hollywood Palladium is also another one. Uh, welcome to the Hollywood Palladium, ladies and gentlemen, the king of the brown sound. Sonny was in that. And that also was supposedly studio. Yeah. So you made Henry Lee Parrilla, who you can see today in a lot of venues, uh, one of the greatest piano players and, and a musical genius. Henry Lee Parrilla is one of the, as a musical genius. You can see him playing, you know, bars and cafes and stuff like that. He does solo acts and mm -hmm. then he does a little trio and and he still travels. But uh, yeah, these, he was he was also with a with this particular group, uh, of Sonny, and uh, he does the in fact he does the introduction. Mm -hmm. He does the introduction on that. And, when, and, this, and I want to show you the road gestures. The road gestures talk about uh, moving from from what when they first started. It was a, a three-man group: Luis Calante, and then you had Henry Hernandez and Oscar Lawson, the original three. Mm -hmm. Then they they catch this kid that can really sing, mm -hmm. and they bring him into the band, and, and that was uh, uh, Dimas Garza. Mm -hmm. Dimas mm -hmm. comes in and he does a couple of numbers with the gestures. And then later went on to, to, to record his own stuff, monster. But after that, Dima steps out. Luis Calante quits or does whatever he has to do. Mm -hmm. Enter um, Jack Martinez out of Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. He's an Italian, looks Mexicano, big tall guy. Enters him, and you got uh, Jack Martinez. You got Henry Hernandez. And now, uh, taking uh, as the Oscar Lawson's place, Raul Cortez comes in, mm -hmm. creates gestures number, th th number two. Mm -hmm. And this particular picture, this is right above, there used to be a market, actual market, where the market square is today, Mi Tierra, mm -hmm. across the street, where there's a pavilion and they sell gifts. Mm -hmm. That was an actual drive-through market, open air market, oh, two, wow. two stories. Uh -huh. This picture's taken on the upper deck, and if you know, the, notice the picture in the back, you see Mi Tierra's, there's Mi Tierra's, uh, the sign is there. Yeah, you do. And those, and that, that group right there, you got Joe Posada, you got Joe Jama, you got a bunch of people who went on their own after this. This is like almost third and fourth generation gestures. Mm -hmm. 
See, so the gestures, and, and, and they, they all put out music. These guys are, ended up putting out a lot of Spanish music. Who's that, who's that record label? This, uh, the record label, uh, record label is uh, CCP, but it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is a, uh, it is a, no, it's an original. It's an original. Uh, it's not a duplicate. Because there's a lot of companies that duplicated a bunch of this stuff, mm -hmm. and they have no value at all. I mean, yeah, it's good for it because they play well on your record player, mm -hmm. but they don't have ca the cash value. This thing, this particular album was meant, this is probably go for four or five hundred bucks. Wow. You know, because there are, there are records, uh, Joe Jama, uh, his uh, My Life, or Sweet, uh, sweet uh, what is that, Sleep uh, Late, My Sweet Lady Friend, mm -hmm. that sells for much, uh, uh, 45, and right now uh, England's paying 6,000 for it, if wow. you get it in mint condition. Wow. Um, is there anything just that you want to say, anything you want to you want to add in for the end of the of the interview about West Side Sound? Well, the, like I said, the West Side Sound for me is, is the, the, the to me, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is the, the purest uh, Chicano English translated music that offered. Uh, to the to the you know to the soul of Mexicano Chicanos whatever you want to call yourself uh, uh, something that belongs to us mm -hmm. it's not doesn't come from the West Coast uh, we programmed somebody else's music we probably played it and re recorded it but it had a message to us and it, it just penetrates your soul man mm -hmm. and there's nothing else that can do that besides Frank Sinatra mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but no, that's uh, to me uh, the West Side Sound, and uh, it's, it's sad that it's uh, like I said the message, and the collections are gonna go by the wayside because if you don't sell this stuff, your mm -hmm. wife will eventually throw it away. Yeah. This in the way, you know what I mean? My wife already threatened me with that. Yeah. So uh, I told her she says she's gonna have a garage sale the day I die and sell my stuff for twenty five cents. So <laughs> these are not a lot of her collectors. I know she says okay, fifty cents. <laughs> so yeah, that that's a, that's a. The sad thing, Jeremy, I'm gonna tell you right now, is that I wish I had another 15 years to live, so I can see this 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 journey and go and end up in a safe place. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and actually, like UTSA is fine, and that's uh, they, but for this, this stuff will still lay dormant if I gave them everything I had until somebody comes around and asks. Mm -hmm. By the way, do you have this? Mm -hmm. Does this exist? Because even the guys that are in England are collecting this music at ridiculous prices. It's gonna die. Yeah. It's, it's gonna die. It's it's like like Glenn Miller. Who listens to Glenn Miller anymore? Mm -hmm. You know that type of stuff. Will be, they just they eventually everything just fades away, just like our lives. Yeah. But yeah. like I said, I like to give thanks to the West Side and my raza that taught me what my culture was. And to this day, I still I still go by those rules. It's honesty, integrity, and uh, and your word. I always tell my son, you got two things, brother: your name and your word. Mm -hmm. We're you don't mess that up. Mm -hmm. A shake hand is a contract, and you and you're bound by that contract. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Herrera, I want to thank you for taking the time to to do this interview with us. Um, we are going to store these videos, like I said, at the UTSA collections. Sure. Um, there will be an event at the end of, of this, um, of this uh, series of interviews, and we'll invite you to that. I appreciate um, that. And uh, we appreciate your time and, and your patience. Thank you very much. Thank Mary you. Jeremy. Thank you. It's nice meeting you. Good meeting you.